portion of the show wherein members of the audience here and other distinguished personages select news items that were previously read and solicit my spontaneous analyzation thereof. You're going to have to stop the tape. He dropped the cue cards. <laughs> Extemporaneous. Yeah. Well, you don't even know the meaning of the word. Get my writers. All right. Well, I'd had a response. <laughs> Sitting on his steps, a man pondered. If naming certain kinds of rodents squirrels made them more acceptable, can we be certain that we haven't somewhere in the past done something similar? And of course forgotten it, obviously. But done something similar to our own thinking? What in the hell could that mean? I mean, the first part you can almost live with. You know, assuming you're pretty much of a hermit and, you know, hard up for a roomie, I guess. Because you could say, well, it is nice. In fact, some time back, if you recall, there was a news item somewhere about some island. I can't remember the name in the, I think, supposedly the Caribbean, but that had trouble. Their tourist trades were getting wrecked by squirrels, I mean by rats. And they, lived, and they came up with some new name for it, if you recall. I forget now, something like fuzzy-tailed land squirrels or something. <laughs> but anyway, they, I can't remember. But they came up with a whole new thing like Caribbean choo-choo or you know, pina colada tree, tree land squirrels or something. Anyway, after they renamed them, they said, you know, everything was fine. Business went back to booming. So, on that same basis, you could, you could, I think, with some moral certainty, if not intellectual something or other, buy into the first part. That is, if naming certain kinds of rodents, squirrels, which, well, they're rats. But think about, not only they look cuter, but even, even though they look cuter, I submit to you, it would not be the same if we still called them rats. Even though you could say, well, yeah, but some rats, like the ones that live in my backyard in trees, they, they, they look a, lot, a bit more, I don't know, domestic, friendly, than your average Norwegian brown rat fresh off of a ship with a little cardboard suitcase looking for a home. <laughs> Ellis Island's that way, sir. <laughs> but if naming certain kinds of rats, naming them squirrels, I submit to you, besides their more agreeable looking appearance than your average house in Norwegian brown rat, if naming that squirrels made them more acceptable, which I am submitting to you very strong that it did, and I submit to you very strong that you can't submit a negative response to that. I submitted first so we won't stop. And if that's true, if that is true, that sort of thing, then the man asks the question, how can we be certain that we haven't done anything at all similar as regards our own thinking? And the part that I kind of approach when I said, get those cue cards back up there. When I asked the part about <laughs> about what the hell could that mean, what in the world? I mean, we haven't really named thinking, right? I mean, I've never known anything else. You can't. Some of you I know have read way back in history, back whenever, you know, hell, 50 or 100 years ago, whenever history started, don't yeah. the Greeks and all that crap. And they've been talking about thinking all this time. They never called it like rats. Or, you know, anything like that. So we hadn't changed the name of it, as far as I know. So what in the, what in the hell could that mean? I mean, the man pondered it. For some reason I was taking that time. If he pondered it, I thought at least we could give it a few seconds worth of consideration on our own. He says, how can we be certain that we haven't done something similar as regards thinking? Simply put, he is saying, is it possible that we have called thinking something else? trying to draw some sort of parallel, I will assume, over the fact that there he sits on the back stairs, he being you, generically, you look out and there runs a friendly little squirrel, fuzzy-tailed, bopping around, 
cute little face. You could even imagine if you're a tolerable, to a tolerable degree, an animal lover, even domesticating the little thing, having it on your shoulder, living in the house. While, while knowing, if you, if you stop and point out, while knowing, yeah, it's a rodent. It's the same family, it's, it's just a rat, but he lives in a tree and he's got a fuzzy tail, and his face is not, you know, you got to admit, a squirrel looks better just by, we don't have to get into some kind of philosophical argument over the classical or Grecian ideas of what beauty is. I just think most people think a squirrel's face looks a bit cuter than your average Norwegian brown rat. I don't, I hope. Nobody from the Scandinavian countries write me to fix, you know, because I kept seeing the Norwegian brown rat, but in case you don't know, that is the one that most people seem to <clears throat> find unusually ugly. <laughs> so if the man sits there, you being the man, and he looks out, and he thinks, how cute a little squirrel is. And then simultaneously, if you jumped up and said, well, you understand, that's not but a rat. I know he lives in a tree, and he's got a fuzzy tail, but he's a rat. I mean, just the sound, a rat. Squirrel, rat. All right. <laughs> but then consider, all right, thinking. The man's sitting there and he's thinking. Well, he's thinking about this. So he's thinking and then asking, well, consider the possibility that we have changed the name from rat to squirrel. And it sounds more acceptable. It is proven to be more acceptable. Yes. What if something similar has happened to thinking? And then the man's left with, well, wait a minute. As far as I know, we've never changed the name. Just because you don't know something. And there are several news items tonight, whether we get to them or not, I'm sure we won't, but whether we get to them or not, that point out one man said, you can't fool me. And he answered, he says, sure I can. Plus you've got no way of ever knowing whether I do or not. And he answered back, well that ain't fair. Huh? Just because the man would sit there, you being the man, and say, well, that's not... That's no fit question to respond to, to say, are you, how can we be sure we haven't done anything similar as regards our own thinking? Because I don't remember us changing the name. I have never read any, I've never even read an opinion, even a crackpot opinion. This said that we have changed the name of thinking from what something it was previously, such as rat, and changed it to thinking. There, there's no record of that. There's no theories of that. He didn't hear the news item I just said? I mean, that proves a lot, right? Well, I don't, I don't remember anything like that happening, whatever that is. Well, hey, that proves it. Case closed. I mean, that's just one step less than saying, no, I disagree. No, I, I, I certainly disagree with the universe. Is, I've read all those things, but as far as I'm concerned, my uncle told me years ago that uh, the furthest thing you can see is about 500 miles that way. Well, hey, case closed. You know, junk cosmology. The man disagreed. I was afraid somebody was about to get close to understanding us when I... No, I didn't. You just... Somebody took a nap. I think I'll reread this one because I'm not sure when they handed it to me, but it didn't really go over. It was a religious maxim update. And religious maxim, uh, if I may pinpoint it, maybe no one knows this in our esteemed audience. But it's a religious maxim circa first two decades of this excellent century. And it's a takeoff on a certain well-known quote from the teens of the century. But this version goes, there are no critics in a foxhole. Maybe I better tell you. The original was there are no there are no atheists in a foxhole. Now surely somebody on the plains of Marathon, I was afraid you'd bring that back up. <laughs> Somewhere probably thousands of years ago, some Greek, some Spartan, well maybe not the Spartans. They were they weren't they weren't sissies. But the Macedonians, the Greeks, somebody, the Phoenicians. We know they were sissies. But the name, <laughs> Phoenician. Imagine if you were, you know, they were having a fight this week. I hate to get off the subject, but I don't care. If it was in Vegas and we were having a fight and you had a little extra money to wager and it was between a Phoenician and a Spartan. And even if you know anything about history, such as the Spartans, the way they had a form of 
population control. <laughs> if you don't know, every kid that was born, well, all the female kids, I think they immediately kill them unless they look real sharp right at birth. But the men, they had another thing. They walked out by this ice cold river, it's supposed to be an ice cold year round, and they just held a kid up. And if they saw any sign of fear, of course, this is getting past the point that he was crippled or looked at all lame. He already supposed to look like Joe, you know, Mr. America. Anyway, about half the kids got dropped in the river and just, you know, if they could live, they could end up dying in Greece and become, you know, Phoenicians or somebody. <laughs> the Spartans didn't want anything to do with them. That was so at any rate, who would you put your money on? In case you think this was off the subject, that was a joke. It wasn't really. Who are you going to, forget the odds, somebody, this one guy, this one civilization, this one source of ideas are named Phoenicians. Another guy's named Spartan. I don't know about you. Do you remember where we were? The story was, the original, the source of the quote from which this was derived, was that there are no heathens in foxholes. That version, that English version, came about from World War I, the point being that a man, it's no idea that everyone, everybody can laugh. I'll just make up one. I'm sure somebody's done it. But everyone can scoff at God until he suddenly you know, comes down with lung cancer. And it's, surprising, and it's surprising how many people suddenly think, I believe I'll get them to roll me down the street in my chair and see kindly old father so-and-so. I hadn't seen the priest now in 20 or 30 years. And I don't know. It just came to him. I didn't have anything to do, and I believe I will. That kind of thing. That a man could be an atheist until they draft him and stick him over there by the marginal line. Don't, it, don't try to sing it. Yeah. There he is, stuck in the mud out there in Flanders, the Germans shooting at him, or the French or somebody, according to which side you're on. <clears throat> Nobody liked the one about rolling mythology on its side and tickling it's close to its private parts. Back to, that was back to this news item. The thing was, a man could be an atheist until they stuck him in that foxhole and he was out there. You know, either for hours or back if you, those of you that remember and adore World War I, for months, for years. And that same fact, bullets flying overhead and your buddies falling dead. The story is there are no atheists in the foxhole. You can be until they stick in the battlefield and you're out there and the bullets going around and suddenly, you know, guys turn around and say, do you know how to pray? You know, do you have a Bible? That kind of thing. Now do you know where we are? There's another one. What do you mean you can't pray? You don't know anything? There's two guys in a foxhole. This is off the subject. Same thing as Vegas. The one guy says, well, no, I never went to church or anything. He said, you mean you got to be 20 or 20, as old as you are, and you don't know anything about religion or prayer? And he said, well, we did live, I forgot, we lived next door to a Catholic church. And he said, well, surely, if you live next door, you picked up something from prayers or something. So his buddy starts praying, the bus are flying. This guy goes, all right, B-17. <laughs> oh, six. Now I, put, now I put your money on the Spartans, even against the Catholics. Still but on the Spartans. Back to where we were. The religious maxim update. There are no critics in a foxhole. Now you do catch where this came from now since obviously you guys didn't know it. There are no atheists in a foxhole. Suddenly everyone becomes you know, religious. Praying that they'll get their young ass out of there alive. Doing whatever it would take. Prayer wise, because we'll assume that physically there's nothing they can do. You're in a foxhole. They're, you know, they're shooting. This one says there are no critics in a foxhole. Now think about it. The foxhole being you're shot at apparently the battle of life. You know, the personal attacks, all of the affronts, and even some of the backs that get some people. The insouciance by which life treats you and your multi talents. The indifference, the hostility, the aggression, the fact that you haven't had a piece of ass in two years. You know, <laughs> that kind of the assaults of life. In a foxhole. This, this one says there are no critics. In a foxhole. And after all of that, if you had had uh, the questionable wherewithal to have understood it without all my explanation, it could have stopped there. But no! Huh. No. Bunch of dashes in that second line. There are no critics in the foxhole. In other words, who's going to criticize life if you're being shot at? Remember, this is not that far a jump from there are no atheists in the foxhole to there are no critics in the foxhole. Not a big jump, just enough that it makes no sense to the ordinary. So, I assume they've all left now, so lesson up.
There are no critics in the foxhole. There you are. It's not just the ordinary, we'll assume, run of assaults, affronts, and abacks and indifference from life that you are being subjected to, trying to hunker down, trying to get by. If it reached that kind of critical stage, then I suggest, or this news on does, that there are no critics. Not just, forget the atheist part now, critics. How are you going to criticize if life's to the point that's about to cut you down? At least you assume, you fear. What are you going to criticize? Right? So you could leave it there. But no, uh-uh. That almost makes sense. <laughs> on to the second line, on to the conclusion. There are no critics in the foxhole dice. Well, leastwise not on a hormonal battlefield. And with that, we'll move on. Well, what are you going to do when it takes, you know, like 20 minutes to do a two-liner, and then you end up with one that's almost to a page? Well, if you're ordinary, so it's going to take twice as long. Do it the other way around. In the chemical world of ideas, anyone you step on, may I suggest you also, not anyone as a person, but idea. In the chemical world of ideas, anyone you step on sticks to your foot. The curious gait that you observe on the ballroom floor of life can be explained in part by the gum on everyone's feet. <laughs> After retuning his guitar and slipping the slide on his finger, he announced, here's a new blues tune that I wrote especially for my mind. It's entitled, I'm sticking with you, baby, as if I had a choice. And then there's a definition to close out. It says, a real thinker. Now, this is tied. Don't, these are not all disjointed. Definition of real thinker. One who, even under the impossible circumstances, has somehow, anyway, come up with some kind of cockamamie, look-alike, something he can pass off as choice. That wraps up what anybody, any sane, sequentially driven mind would say, either after listening to some of this or stuck off on their own. As I point out, all human minds know this. They just can't go anywhere with it. It puts them into gridlock. To say, you've got no choice. You could say directly, forget the idea of the debates of free will. There is no free will. And the man can say, well... There's got to be because I can either agree with that or not. <laughs> to realize that there is no choice. In a closed system, the idea, again, we're assuming all the ordinary sane people left the room. Those kind of people that think there's still a debate over nature versus neuter. Neuter, neuter, neuter? Is it neuter or <laughs> neutering? <laughs> I always forget what they think they're talking about. They, they say it's the battle, the struggle between nature, naturing and neutering or neutering. Well, I always think, well, it can't be neutering. And now I look around at the kind of people that said it and I go, well, maybe I misunderstood the original. Maybe they did say neutering. Heredity versus environment and all that. Same thing. Uh, if you were suddenly struck with the absolutely unturnable away fact that there's no such thing as choice let's just say that let's, let's just say it for the sake of this so we can go into the next page then if that be true <clears throat> then it gave a definition of a real thinker even within that context it says that one who even under conditions that we just said the impossible conditions that is that you got no choice there's no such thing forget it even under those conditions a real thinker is one who will somehow he comes up with some kind of cockamamie you know, look-alike. You know, something he can pass off. You know, who knows? You know, some kind of straw man he got up or something that you used to buy. I guess you guys are too young. Sound alike records. If you couldn't afford the real thing, you go to Woolworths or Kmart. You get a whole album for 29 cents. And say, you know, the Beatles' greatest hits. And then way down to the bottom it said, done by the sound alikes. <laughs> Now, you see, some people, you know, and laugh, but wait a minute. What if you could not get 
real Beatles records or whoever you like. Lawrence Welk. And you had to settle for that. Huh? If there is no such thing as intellectual choice, if that's a given, if it was a fact, and then you find, well, there's something you kind of pass off. It sounded like choice. At first you go, well, give me a break. Until I point out, well, there's no real one. It's not an imitation of something real. Then you're left with, well, no, why not? Unless you're ordinary. And then you think, no, 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 this is getting worse and worse. <laughs> what do you mean? It's, a, it's some kind of cockamamie imitation of something that doesn't exist? Hey, give me a what? A door prize? No, a break. All right. Give the ordinary people a break. That's what they want. Give them a break. It's what God made the remote for. <laughs> a man met some city intellectuals and said to them, city intellectuals. Thus far, there's no sarcasm, no nothing. I, I would know it if it was there. He met some city thinkers, city intellectuals. And he said to them, you know, be so kind, would you tell me, pass along to me anything that you know that's worthwhile, anything that you actually know. But don't tell me a personal anecdote. Does that about take care of that or what? <laughs> what if that was read in a great <coughs> philosophy class in a university somewhere? Let's just say, I picked, and the professor read that. And he did what I did, like, huh, does that about cover it? Follow this. So we're inside one of my stories, inside of a story. You can follow that. Let's say that we're in an ordinary first class, admirable, renowned, Professor of Philosophy's class. And he says, hey, let me read you something that I came in with. It says, a man met some city intellectuals and said to them, tell me anything worthwhile, anything insightful, revealing, anything meaningful. Just tell me anything that you actually know. I'm here. You know, I want to learn. Tell me anything you know, but don't tell me personal anecdotes. And let's say that you were sitting there in undergraduate philosophy and the professor seemed to smile. And, you know, you're not being a dummy. You kind of chuckle. Ha, ha, ha. And then the professor says, that reminds me back when I was in school. <laughs> That's worse than having no choice, isn't it? You mean I can't tell personal anecdotes? How do I know I'm a personal? Well, I don't know. Go look in the mirror. That doesn't work. I wanted to hear it from you. And you say, well, you know, I met a guy like you one time that asked me the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're into the third level of stories within stories within stories. And I know some of you in an earlier life suffered from migraines anyway, so we won't go on. Romance and morality revisited. You can cheat on your wife with but slight attritions but you cannot be untrue you can't run around you can't be untrue to local conditions <laughs> ah yes added Professor Sardonicus once you've been screwed by the best nothing else will do <laughs> but do you realize that that is the again at the heart of for instance using it just as the archetypical the best example religion but morality civil behavior, the laws of society, that that is the basis of it, of believing that in some way you can not, not run around your wife, I mean, big deal, that you can cheat on life, local conditions a little more specific. Rather than thinking that might sound silly, but if you people have been following up to now, you know that there is such thing as local conditions, Local reality. What is all religion? It's more widespread than that, but religion is the easiest one to use as a verbal example. What is the heart of all religion? Put another way, what is it that religion without that would be out of business? Besides someone to correct <laughs> deformed sentences. <coughs> what is it? Without which, religion would be out of business. Uh-huh. And don't say silly costumes. <laughs> and playgirl centerfolds. 
What is it without which religion will be out of business? And I'll tell you, the belief that you can cheat, be untrue, run around on local conditions. Without that, religion is kaput. Without that, well, and everything connected to it, and even, as I said, without exception, into the very intestines and bowels of life itself. Ugh. <laughs> but think about it, if you have to, that you're going to cheat on life. That suddenly life, local conditions, or as they would have it, God, What do you mean coming in here at 3 o'clock in the morning? Where have you been? Should not your attitude be, you're God and you ask me where I've been? <laughs> and of course by God we're doing it with a small g. It's reality. All right, you want to, how about a little more on a scientific level? As far as I know, probably all of you from looking, I think, live in this universe. Well... Most, yeah, most of it. Instead of calling it just local conditions or God, you live in the universe. You come in one night in the universe. And if you like this bunch of local conditions, reality, hey, let's get big time. The universe. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> Where could I go? Where could I go that you wouldn't know? Where could I go that's not you? Uh, the reason that, that sounds sort of funny and the reason that you know you can't walk out of here and do anything with it is because it's a point blank wall. There is no response to it other than, ah, oh, never mind that. Well, that's right, I keep forgetting we, you know. I keep forgetting city intellectuals. Ah, I don't, never mind all that. <laughs> and one more time, not just religion. The whole part of, at least one part of the friction, the right mix of friction and glue that seems to hold civilization together, which is the only part of the universe we're talking about. That part is what men believe that they're cheating on. And it's that part that you would once you translate that way, that you would tell somebody, if, if they would listen, how can you worry about the way you're living in some moralistic sense, religious sense, uh, philosophical sense of any kind, when part of it is shouldering guilt, whether it be religious or just the feeling that, well, I'm unworthy or life is not just, the universe is not just, maybe. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. And then you pull this on them, if they would listen. And so do you understand that everything that seems to drive the world of man, that is the singular neural world of man, is in some way based upon the belief that in some way you're shortchanging, cheating on, or for you in the South, fooling around with, or fooling around on, local conditions, or the universe. And all you got to do is think for one second, if you can think at all for a second, and you realize, wait a minute, you know, this is beyond funny. There's no word for this. Well, there is several words, but they don't hear that either. You know, like freedom, originality, and wait a minute, somebody shot my brain. I mean my duck. <laughs> Do not want to shortchange those fine Scandinavian authors. <laughs> Back to, at least I'll make it too cloudy again. Using religion as an archetypical example. All forms of the things that hold society together from religion to how about your mama saying shame on you for doing so and so. <coughs> All of it is on the basis that man on the belief, the assumption, the operational assumption that you can be untrue to life. That you can walk in in the universe. <laughs> Where have you been? Where the hell do you think I've been? Where could I go? And you could get people for a second. Maybe they'll go, ah. But what can you do with it if you're ordinary? You mean besides nothing? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> but Professor Sardonicus, which we don't have to go into that. That was, I think, written for the 
man in the street. But at any rate, a man, after all of this, says, once you've been screwed by the best, nothing else will do. That would require that you not be ordinary and be able to hear the first part and not go into intellectual gridlock. That's when you realize, hey, I have been screwed by the best. You don't have to worry about cheating on life, being untrue to local conditions, staying out past a reasonable hour and the universe wait up for you. All of those. It's to understand that, hey, I won't say anything else, but when you understand what it is, that's when you realize I have been screwed by the best. But not when you say once you've been screwed by the best, once doesn't mean anything once you understand that. Once means up until now. It doesn't mean once, it doesn't mean at one time life screwed me. It means once you've been screwed by the best, that is, let's pick an age. Let's say that you suddenly was able to realize this at the age of, let's say, 30. Then saying, once you've been screwed by the best, what that means is, having been screwed for these last 30 years by the best, hey, now nothing else will do, now that I realize it. And the point is, nothing else will do. May I point to you, that's a safe bet. There is nothing else, once you realize it. You don't call that a, if you'll pardon the jeu de moi, a fitting climax to the news story. <laughs> to realize... Realize no one's waiting up on you. You can't cheat on life. You cannot be untrue to local conditions. And then you realize that. And you think, well, once you've been screwed by the best, that is, right until right now, until I understand, once you've been screwed by the best, that is, nonstop, continuous, you, you're alive. Up until now, once you've been screwed by the best, nothing else will do. Because there is nothing else after that. But that would require that you be able to look at a point blank wall and suddenly become willfully, in a sense, that you have willfully enriched your own simplicity. Nothing else will do. There is nothing else. So it's simple to say, well, nothing else will do. I have been screwed by the best for 30 years, and it's like, boy, I hate to, I'll do it. You suddenly realize it, and you also realize that no one else, probably in the world, knows it but you. And you realize it, and you couldn't be happier. I don't know what to call it. Yeah. How about you couldn't be less non-happy? We, we accept that. You couldn't be more pleasantly astounded because it's everything you ever wanted to know is you realize, wait a minute. Never, not only have I never been untrue to life, you can't be untrue to life. And then you realize, though, me thinking that for the last, let's say, 30 years has been me being screwed by the best. But now that I see it all, there's one thing for sure. Once you've been screwed by the best, nothing else will do. Which is another way of saying, as another guy did in another news item, that God, were it true, that you can't go back home. That's what that saying is once you've been screwed by the best and realize it, nothing else will do. That is, once you see it, you can't go back. But see, everybody else has to go back. Ordinary minds. Even if they caught a glimpse of this, that's what I mean by intellectual gridlock. They've got to go back. They can't go anywhere with it. They can almost hear it. I mean, you can get people to hear this under the right condition. They go, oh. <laughs> and I, you know, I drag it out. It's not really that long. It's just almost instantaneously they have to decide, well, this is a bunch of slop. Or, you know, I misunderstood. And I just, they just, the mind can't do anything with it. And so they have to go back uh, to being screwed, not by the best. They're still getting screwed by the best, but they don't know it. Because they keep feeling guilty. They keep thinking, well, it's an illicit affair. <laughs> They think, well, I'm being untrue to life. I should, I should be in church more. I should work harder. I should be dumber. I mean, more ordinary. I should be more middle class. I should be home with my wife and kitties. I should get some wife and kitties. I should be doing something. I should not be what I am, which is, well, more or less unfaithful to life. Unfaithful, well, I know they call it things like untrue to myself. I have not reached my full potential. <sighs> <laughs> Pardon me, that, that one always, that always gets me to hear ordinary people kind of swell up a bit and say, well, I have yet to reach my full potential. And of course, you don't normally say anything to ordinary people, but it's off to yourself. You can think, well, oh, Jesus, you know, looking at you and hearing you say that, you know, I sure, I sure hope I'm not around if you ever do. 
There's an old Cajun. Now I think about a story that had to do with that. In fact, I'm going to tell you. Because it is the same thing. They didn't know it. I didn't even know it. I didn't tell the story in 30 or 40 years. That one guy, there was an old house outside of town. About 40 miles outside of, I got to say it, Baton Rouge. <laughs> it was all, and all the people claimed it was haunted and so and so. Somebody died there and all that. And they said the spirit of Dirty Dick, Dirty Pierre. I'll make it sound better like it was actually a Cajun story. <laughs> Dirty Pierre would come there on certain nights and would just do ungodly, unspeakable acts to anybody that was there in the house. You know, let's say the 17th of each month. So this one guy claimed he was real nervy and all that. And they said, you, well, you know, they got up a pot of money and said, we'll bet you you won't go in on the 17th and stay there all night because Dirty Pierre will show up and you'll be sorry. So they go through all this stuff. And he had a few drinks. So he goes there. And, you know, his friends stay outside. They close all the doors. And it's you know, pitch black in there. And the guy's in there. And it gets to be you know, midnight. Creaking sounds, all kinds of stuff. And suddenly that door flies open. And there stands this huge green looking thing covered in moss. And fire coming out of its eyes. And this guy that's in there, he says, God almighty. He says, are you dirty, Pierre? The thing goes, uh. And suddenly disappears. And then like two o'clock, there's another horrendous sound. And there's this thing that's like 500 pounds. And it's covered in purple scales. I'm just having to make all this, you know. And it's got rats and lice and snakes going all over it. And it's got like 4,000 little fingers that are sharp as nails. And he gets up close to the guy and leans over. And he says, oh my God, dirty Pierre. And the thing suddenly stops and he goes, no, no, no. And it leaves. And the guy finally, he just collapses. And he sleeps for a while and he doesn't know when. And he suddenly hears this, the most ungodly sound he ever heard in his life. I can't even try to describe it. I, I said it, most ungodly. What do you want? Indescribable. And he opens his eyes, and the door slowly from another room opens. And it's this most sickening smell. And it's this thing, I don't know. Two heads. You know, eyes, you know, falling out. And the thing you know, is hunched over, and it's the size of like 20 men. The most sickening smell. And it's got dead people, you know, taped to his legs. <laughs> Come on, let me finish. And the guy's down on the floor and he looks up. And he says, if that ain't dirty, Pierre, I'm out of here. <laughs> Do you see? I didn't bring that up for a joke. Do you see where we were? Let huh? me change the punchline. Why are you? If you ain't dirty, Pierre, I ain't going to be here when he gets here. Uh, yeah, I can hear that. <clears throat> see, I'm, I've backed up a minute or so. It's an ordinary person hearing what we're talking about. The once you've been screwed by the best, once you realize you can't be untrue to life. They can lock you up in a room. I mean, look at the locked up story. In, uh, the guy locked up here waiting for a monster. Look at that as religion. Look at that as all forms of guilt. Look at it as men always assuming that the worst is going to happen. If nothing else, death. But they're always waiting for the worst thing can happen. But uh, I shouldn't have drugged that in. That's the easy way out and back in, if you notice one tonight. But people think there's something worse than death. Or they wouldn't even fool with religion. They wouldn't fool with shouldering the kind of guilt if they thought, well, death is it and there's nothing worse because they think there is something worse. There's no reason that they can make all the human institutions and civilization, if not even fly, at least float. But do you understand that's also what the human mind is saying when I was describing that it could hear, an ordinary mind can hear this sort of thing to point out that, hey, how are you going to be untrue to life? I know they'd say God, but we've already passed all that. And I've expanded it for How can you believe that you're going to do something offensive to the universe? How are you going to come in late? How are you going to come in with exotic lipstick on your collar from strange gods, from strange philosophies? 
in the universe say, grab you by the collar and look down there and say, huh, where have you been? What do you mean, where have I been? Have you been cheating on me? With who? I mean, you're the fucking universe. How am I going to cheat on you? You can get people to go momentarily. But what they do is that, and then look off. What they're doing is say, hey, if that ain't dirty Pierre, I ain't going to be here when he gets here. That is, if, if this thought don't kill me, then you know, I don't want to think it again. You know, let me out of here. That you look at, that was what I was trying to describe, you know, the huge thing and, you know, terrible odor and dead people taped to his leg. That is the ordinary mind suddenly being confronted with and being able to see. Not confronted, you can't force them, but it just slips up and they suddenly see the point blank wall. It's like, God Almighty, you know, if that's not Lucifer, if that's not the gates of hell, if that's not dirty Pierre, I ain't going to be here when he does get here. I don't hear more of this shit. That's what the mind's saying. Is, no. Uh -uh. All right. Did anybody hear that? Was that? That's what I was wondering. There's another old story. Well, shit, I'm beginning to scare myself. The punchline. Fill in your own. Well, maybe... It's about a guy trying to scare people. You know, like little kids. And you can look at it instead of a guy scaring kids, you can look at his life's institutions, priests. You know, trying to scare people. I think the original one that somebody around here made up was about a guy for a joke. They used to live... Yeah, I did make that up. All right. guy used to live, there's a whole little village below this dam. And once or twice a year... This one guy would get a few drinks in him. So I hear some people do. And kind of, and he would begin to run down the street and holler, The dam's busted. The dam's busted. We're all going to die. And people would run for it. Yeah, he did this four or five years. And people began to, you know, sort of suspect. It was like the kid crying wolf story. And, you know, they'd look. And it never happened. But still, every time he'd do it, because it was such an impending potential disaster right above him, everybody could see it. Everybody in town could <laughs> run. That every time he'd do it, a few people would run, just on the basis that later their friends would say, well, you know he always says that when he gets drunk. And they'd go, yeah, I know, but, you know, <laughs> Jesus. And then one time he hollers, the dam's about to burst, the dam, I can see it cracking. And suddenly he began to run. And somebody ran along beside him and started going to him. And he says, well, you're the one we know you're always fighting. What are you running for? And he said, well, it just struck me. What if I'm right? <laughs> Same thing. Same thing of the noise. And me saying, hey, what if that is Pierre? Hey, what if I'm right? Uh, I was going to read one more. I don't even think I was saying anything, but I just wanted to read it. I just wanted to hear it again. Plus, I'm not sure all of you got it. It is a little... It's not just a joke, but it'll probably end up with a few laughs, and I can close out the tape. But that, Well, all of you know, but now I don't write them as simply jokes. A little known electrochemical fact. Since, regardless of what men have so long and so passionately believed, thusly, that is, that the ship of life, that in spite of what they believe, the ship of life is not sinking. And this has made some men so angry. Now, they don't talk about it, but it's the reality. That is, you understand, men so long, and by so long means as long as men have, there's a recorded history of men talking. As long as the recorded history of man, men have been saying the ship is sinking. They're saying it now. Trust me, the first, I don't know what's the absolute first thing that somebody wrote. I think it was send this collect. I think it was the first thing that Adam wrote. But about the second thing that they wrote down on you know, the wall of the bathroom, you know, called Gloria for a good time. Maybe that was the first thing. But the second piece of graffiti that man wrote in history was everything's going to hell. Now that, there's the history of man, there's the philosophy of man, that's the religion of man, that's everything. Once he started to talk, you know, they don't look at it that way, but look at all the stories of religion. As soon as man learned to talk, what's the first thing he did? Made God mad and God said, hey, go get a job and get out of here. <laughs> so, downhill. I mean, there he was hanging around naked, nothing to do, and then he started talking. You know, Would you pass me that banana? And I said, that ain't no banana, that's another story. <laughs> And the gods threw them out. So, 
at least the second thing that man ever wrote down was everything's going to hell. So for so long, is what it says, men have so passionately believed that the ship is sinking. The ship of life is sinking. And it's proven otherwise is the point. And so it goes like this. The fact that regardless of them saying the ship is sinking, the ship is sinking, everyone says it. All sane people say the ship is sinking. It's just no doubt. And from any ordinary view, yeah, you're an idiot to disagree with it. It's going, things are getting worse. So regardless of the fact that men have been saying that as long as we've had men talking, and they have believed it apparently so passionately, and it's not true. Don't take it just philosophically. You just look. Well, they've been saying it for 5,000 years. Yeah, boy. This is, this is going to make a, a maritime record. I mean, it took a goddamn ship over 5,000 years and the sun, but it still hadn't gone down. You know what I mean? In other words, men don't think about it this way. But, you know, people, everyone says, well, life's going to hell. I said I wasn't going to say anything about it. I just want you to get it. People can say life's going to hell, and if you took a guy and get him in some kind of passing moment of lucidity... And so, and he gives you all the examples, how his son's on dope, and his, you know, his girlfriend's pregnant, and his wife's pregnant, and he's had a vasectomy. <laughs> and, you know, he gives you all the saddest stories he can, you know, that his family lives in uh, Albania, and, you know, it's getting worse and worse. You know, even the museum's gone now. Somebody got the plaster duck, they didn't have any art left in Albania. Forget self-respect and food. You know, he says life is going to hell and it always has. And you say, well, do you realize people's always been saying that? And you quickly show him some of the Greek writings. He goes, well, yeah, I knew that. And you say, would you realize that here it is 5,000 years later? And look at us. You know, and he's telling you, that's why you're seeing this high class, you know, top of the thing restaurant and him drinking you know, $10 drinks. And he's wearing a $500 suit. And he's telling you life's going to hell. And jets are flying by. And he's got a pacemaker. And a gold watch. You know, somebody else says kidney, and you say, and you say, and you point out to him, you say, don't you smell a little something funny? I mean, you say life's going to hell, and I understand all your personal problems. I know that life's been stepping on your dick and everybody else's. But when you say life's going to hell, look, just stop a minute. That's kind of like, wait a minute, if that ain't big, dirty Pierre, I'm getting out of here. Nobody wants to fool with it. The point was, people do know that life's not going to hell. You know, well, all you guys know what I'm talking about. They do not know it intellectually. And it's not because they're stupid. The mind cannot work that way. And so th th they can see it, is what I mean. You can get an ordinary person to, at least momentarily, the same way that you look up and here's you know, that huge thing and all the dead people and, the human, and you go, oh, if this ain't it, I don't want to hear it. For a moment, you can get them to realize, life ain't going to hell. But they absolutely, the mind just shuts that off because if they were stuck there, they're done for. That would be suicidal for an ordinary man. Think about it. For an ordinary man to suddenly realize that life is not going to hell, where would he go next? You'd find him still there. Forget, you know. Lot's wife would look like Richard Petty. <laughs> you, you'd come back and find this. You'd come back 5,000 years later, if you want to be allegorical, and the guy that you made realize that suddenly he realized, well, life's not going to hell. <laughs> where, where, however he was when he saw that, you'd come back. No hurry. You know, pick his pocket. Take your time. <laughs> 5,000 years later. <laughs> he couldn't move after that. Back to the news item. So that's what I mean. That people know. I mean, it can be shown to them, and a sane mind will go, you're right. You know, something sure is fishy for me to believe and everyone else to believe. Life's going to hell. God, is taking a long time. If the ship's sinking, you know, it ain't ever going to actually get down, is it? So, back to the news item. Regardless that men have so long believed the ship of life is sinking. That's the tacit part, the way I'm slaughtering my original writing of it. But since the ship of life is not sinking, in spite of what they have so long believed and continue to believe, the fact that it's not has made some men so angry and, not to shortchange it, embarrassed, without them knowing it, that they took up dying. They, they came up with the concept of dying just to try and make it appear that their corrections had some validity. 
I was going to stop there, but I guess some of you, if you're an ordinary person, say, well, now that's a hell of a price to pay just to prove you're right. That's what being ordinary is. <laughs> I trust I've made my point. 